Hello everyone, so today we're going to talk about the properties of water. We've all heard that water is important. We drink a lot of water, well we should, and we know that it's very important to our body and it's important to our planet. We are made up of about 60% water, so water is very important, but we do we really know why? What properties make water so unique and so important for living organisms? Okay, so we're going to talk about that a little bit. We can start off by remembering the hydrogen bonds. Remember how hydrogen bonds are bonds between water molecules. Remember how they're really weak, so they're easily breakable, easily uh, allow us to easily manipulate water, break it and put it back together, and water just comes back together. So they're weak bonds. They're not between a hydrogen and an oxygen. They are between the molecules themselves. Okay? So just for a little quick reminder on that. Now, let's talk about the first property um, of water. So water, water has a high specific heat. High specific heat. I'm gonna underline this. It's important. Okay. So what specific heat? Um, specific heat is the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature one degree. Symbol, but I'll just type it out. So, what does it mean by water having a high specific heat? That water needs a lot of heat in order to change one degree, and that's very, very important. And that's actually, that's actually um, pretty cool because if you see this little image of this fish, um, imagine the day gets hot uh, really quickly, and then it gets cold again at night. If water needed a little bit of specific heat, then the temperature would really change drastically. Okay, so for example, if it's on a hot day, it takes a day to be really, really hot to make the water really, really hot. Have ever, any of you ever been to like the pool or the beach when it's really hot outside, but the water itself is pretty cold. So it takes a lot of heat to change the temperature of water one degrees. Okay, and that's that's really important. That's in our body, our, our body, um, everything in our body has chemical reactions and they break down stuff. So every time they break down stuff, energy is released. So a lot, all that energy that's released, so if we have water all around our body, imagine all that energy and all that heat that's being released. If water was really low on specific heat, it would change temperatures really fast. So we would heat up really, really fast. Okay. So that's why water is very important that it has a high specific heat. The opposite, a low specific heat, is something that heats up really quickly. Um, for example, aluminum. So you go outside and you touch your car, and think about it. Every time you can go outside and touch the water, and it can be pretty cold. And you touch the your car, the aluminum, and it's really hot. And that's because of a specific heat. One of them needs more heat. The other one needs less heat to change one degrees. Okay. Um, so water moderates a temperature change, like I said. So um, water can really have this, this, the water over here can be really cold. And it can moderate the temperature change even though the heat's coming in, as you can see in San Bernardino or other eastern areas where it's really hot and there's no water, it's even more hot. Okay, so water can help moderate the temperature change. So next to um, areas with water, the temperature can be a little lower thanks to the high specific heat of water. Okay, so that's the first one. It's very important. The second one, um, so let me write down before I move on uh, real quick. So takes a lot of heat to change the temperature of water. Okay. Um, energy is released. So I'm just rewriting what I said so we don't forget about it. Inside in the reaction occur in our body water helps regulate the temperature so the energy is released inside us since we have a and since water has a high specific heat it doesn't really affect us a lot we don't get really hot or really cold very quickly it takes a, a while from all these chemical reactions and everything around us to really change the temperature in our body which is crucial it's very important Okay, so we'll jump to number two. Um, water has a high heat 
a vaporization, okay? High heat vaporization. High heat of vaporization. What does that mean? That means just like um, specific heat, that it takes a lot to change the temperature one degrees, it also takes a lot for water to vaporize. Okay, so um, let's talk about vaporization. Um, same as specific heat, we'll just change it instead of changing one degrees to vaporize if heat needed. Vaporize. Okay. So why is that good? Um, think about us and think about our body and how when you're working out, when you're running, you're sweating, right? We're releasing all these. We're our body makes this um, homeostasis reaction in which it releases this water from the inside or this heat in the form of water and sweat outside. So we have this sweat outside of us. The sweat actually keeps us cold. It actually regulates our water temperature. Um, the water molecules stay in our body, and it gives us that cold water feeling, okay, from the outside. So it's able, we're able to release that energy, and since water stays in us, it doesn't really evaporate. It keeps us cold. So if it had a low heat of vaporization, the water, the sweat would go outside and then just fly away. So we'd have to release and release and release and release all the time, and we still feel hot. So the fact that water takes forever well, not forever, but it takes a long time to vaporize. It helps us uh, maintain this cool environment on the outside every time we're running or we're sweating it out. Uh, on the other hand, like alcohol, we would have alcohol, or if you go out one night before and then the next night, the next morning you go out for a run and sweat it all out, you really have a hot temperature inside of you because you're releasing all this water and all this alcohol outside, and it's really vaporizing or cleaning your body. So water has a high heat of vaporization, okay? So sweat. Helps. This is our example. Helps keep us cool when we run. Water doesn't vaporize, giving us that cool water feeling. Okay. So these are like very basic words. How I think about them, how I explain it, and put it in, in these words. Maybe a little less scientific, but um, we're still getting the main idea and, and the process. Or we got two. Third property of water, we got cohesion and adhesion. Okay? So first, cohesion is how water water molecules stick to other water molecules. It's actually pretty cool. This is how um, this is why water is able to, you know, make these these um, I really can't molecules there it is um how how water has a specific uh, structure or, or how they're able to bond and stick to each other so these water molecules can bond to each other and get touch each other so when you jump in the pool you'll break that water but then it goes back together okay that's cohesion water molecules really attaching to each other and as we know those come from hydrogen bonds so it has good cohesion they can attach to each other okay um, stick to other water molecules and then adhesion PowerPoint would be water, uh, sorry, that's cohesion. So water droplets, it's another example. Um, it, whenever water and the clouds, precipitation and all that, the fact that they can attach to each other and then they fall off and that makes a water droplet. It's also a, a, another example. So these water do droplets are examples of water being cohesive to each other, having that cohesion. Then adhesion, um, it's very similar, but it's water molecules sticking or stick to other molecules and to charged surfaces. Okay, so let's go in here. Okay. So what does that mean? Not not only does do the water molecules themselves attach to each other a lot, but they can also attach to other molecules as well. So they can bind to our, like I said, they can bind to our body and we sweat and we sit. Or if you throw something, some water on the wall, it can stick to the wall and then it'll slowly start dripping off and falling away. So they're able to adhere or uh, attach to other uh, surfaces or other molecules as well. So this is exactly how plants are able to get water from the roots 
and then slowly move it up and up and up through the whole trunk and all the way to the leaves and everything up there. So water is attaching to all these uh, structures or all these surfaces on the trees and it's able to move up. Okay, so cohesion is within each other. Adhesion, adhesion is with other molecules or other surfaces. Okay, so water is pretty sticky, you can say, in simple terms. This is important for our body as, um, as in our blood vessels, how water and all these things are moving through and water can move through our organism as well, our body. So and they're able to adhere or adhere or attach to other molecules and transport water across our body. Or else water if water didn't stick to anything, then it would just stay wherever it landed. And it's able to stick to surfaces and other molecules to transport water all across our body. Okay. So those are examples of cohesion and adhesion. Um, cohesion for example water droplet. I'm jumping into a pool. Adhesion, and you can say tree, trees, and their name water is trunk or surface of the body itself. Okay, so far we got three. Now, number four, this is also something pretty cool that not every um, element, every molecule can do. And that means solid water is less dense than liquid water. And this is why ice floats. It's crazy. It's pretty crazy. It's something that not every single element or molecule can do. So it is really basically the same elements, H2O, that make the water and the ice and the steam and everything. But the way water rearranges when it gets really cold and freezes, it actually makes it less dense. So it's, that's why you, when you put an ice cube in a bottle of water, the ice cubes float. If you would have melted aluminum and then you put aluminum piece, aluminum would go to the bottom. It wouldn't really float, even though it's the same element. So that's what makes um, the water so unique that when it's frozen, it's able to float on its own molecules of water underneath it. It's pretty crazy. Um, so it's mainly just based off the rearrangement and the moving of of these molecules and these bonds so whenever water freezes it rearranges into more um, expanded or a bigger surface area space uh, to make the ice and when you have liquid water you can see in this example um, it's more constantly breaking reforming changing and it's really chaotic in there so that's why the ice since it's more separated it's actually less dense and it just floats it's pretty cool well, um, why is this helpful to us Think about these fishes or these shrimp or all these animals in the ocean. Imagine if they'd be the same. Whenever you have these ice polar sheets, they'd go down to the bottom of the floor. So then the floor or the ocean would start freezing from the bottom up. So everything, all these animals would have to go up and up and up and up and up and up as it's, the water is freezing all over the place. But that doesn't happen. What happens is the ice floats. So the, these animals, so these fishes, um, marine animals, they're able to live underneath. So these ice, this ice makes like a little coat or a layer and it also protects from the heat and everything up there. So it's slowly, uh, the, these water reserves or oceans or lakes or ponds, they freeze from the top down slowly because of what ice is floating all over the place. So it's that's really pretty cool. So it helps maintain a good uh, stable temperature, but also it helps um, these animals not freeze and then not have to go all the way up in order to survive okay, as the ice is coming down. So. So that's what makes it so unique. Okay. So before we get into the question, let's write down a couple a couple of things. Um, the arrangement of hydrogen bond in ice allows it to float. Okay. So if ice floats, the fact that it floats, it helps uh, marine animals um, are able, able and they're able to survive. So by floating it helps. Stable temperature for marine animals. That's just one example. Actually, it's a good question. This also makes the strings fancy. You know, you get this string on the rock. It keeps the rock floating on top instead of the rock being on bottom. But okay, so there. So we got four so far. Let's do a couple questions just to review real quick. And this is kind of you'll have it um, structured on your test. 
So think about breaking down starch uh, into glucose releases heat. So every time we're breaking down food, and we release heat. What property of water explains why our cells don't overheat? So why won't they overheat even though we're releasing a lot of heat? And I remember we got specific heat. So the fact that water has a high specific heat, it allows us not, it allows our body to not overheat quickly. We need more and more and more and more reactions before we actually start changing our temperature, okay? What property of water allows plants to move water from the roots to their leaves? Remember we have here in our temple, cohesion and adhesion. Cohesion is water droplets between each other. Adhesion would be um, to other surfaces and to other um, molecules as well. So cohesion and adhesion. I really can't spell. I'm glad I'm not, I'm not an English teacher. Okay, moving on. Feel free to take a break, take a little pause. Um, we have about eight, nine properties of water. So this can be like a good mid, midterm midpoint for you to take a little pause, okay? So, so far we have that water has a high specific heat. So it takes a lot of heat to really change one temperature, increase or decrease. Water has a high heat of vaporization, so it takes a lot of heat before water vaporizes and it goes up into the sky, into the clouds, into the steam. Uh, water is able to have cohesion and adhesion, so it can stick, it's really sticky between themselves and other molecules and surfaces and allows water to flow through our body and through the roots of trees. And then solid water is less dense than liquid water, and that's actually pretty cool. So every time water turns into ice, it's able to arrange itself in a more spacious way to have less density and float over water molecules as well than liquid water, liquid water. Okay, now number five, water is an excellent solvent. Wow. So I should have explained this before we did the molarity or I, I threw molarity into you guys. So I'll make sure I change that next time. But um, so when we talk about molarity, if you remember, Murray um, equals solute over solvent, okay? So in our solute, it's typically uh, what we add into and in, uh, say our, you're gonna make Kool-Aid, so our solute would be a little Kool-Aid, okay? So it can be the, um, whatever substance, substance that you want to mix into the solvent, okay? So when we make Kool-Aid, when we make lemonade, um, this, the solute would be the little, um, the Kool-Aid patches, or the, we have those little lemonade, um, the lemon, things like that. So that's our solute, whatever we're jumping into the concentration of the solution itself. And then solvent, solvent is the water, or um, the substance that you have the most that you're adding something into, and that would be like the solvent, okay? Um, the water or substance, you want to mix into okay. so water is a great solvent so what does that even mean that means that when we add say in this example NaCl or salt when we add salt um, water is able to break down the salt and then form these little like coverings around it or these layers around it so the um, the negative oxygen regions of that polar water, um, they are attracted to that sodium or this cation. And then on the opposite, remember opposites attract, and the other way around, the positive hydrogens are attracted to the negative ones, um, ions, anions. Cations positive, anions negative, okay? So then it creates this little cloud and it's able to separate them. That's why you can dissolve it and, you know, with your finger, with a string around, move it around, and then the salt will dissolve or the Kool-Aid will dissolve. And that's water working there. It's a great solvent. It's able to dissolve, dissolve all these substances that we add into it. So that would be our solutes. It would be that Kool-Aid or the salt and the solvent and that would be the water. Okay. So molarity is basically the concentration or how much we have of uh, between the solute and the solvent. So the concentration of Kool-Aid and water or so concentration of sugar and water, salt and water. Okay. So, that, so water is an excellent, excellent solvent. So if we were to add something, um, water is, water dissolves um, solutes very well. Okay. So it's able to dissolve or dissociate or break apart, break it down, um, all these solutes that go in there and be able to mix with each other. Once you let it sit there, 
remember we have weak hydrogen bonds so water molecules can break slowly and then that's when you start getting all the sugar on the bottom or the salt on the bottom stir it a little bit more and then they come back and rearrange and go back to them and then slowly they'll break back again also uh, water is able to organize non-polar molecules so let's write down a couple of things here that are going to be important um, polar means uh, water loving or hydrophilic hydrophilic okay. nonpolar means water hating or hydrophobic you know you have a phobia you hate something like that you're scared of something so polar is water loving and nonpolar is water hating or hydrophobic or hydrophilic these are terms that you're going to need to know and memorize Think about the polar bear loves water. So polar is water loving. Okay, it's like high school, a little high school. That phrase, the, the polar bear loves, loves water. So polar is water loving, hydrophilic. Non-polar, water hating or hydrophobic. So what does that even matter? So we have these um, phospholipid layers, okay? Um, and then we have a polar head on the top. Let's see if I can draw something here. Let me just get a little highlighter. So we got a little polar head on the top. And then we also have our nonpolar tails on the bottom, which is nonpolar. So if polar loves water, when you get water, is water going to be on this side next to the nonpolar or next to the polar? Typically, it's over here because it loves water. It loves water. Okay? So it'll be water on this side, and this side really hates water, so it'll be against water. So it's able to assemble or move around these molecules to form in in a way that it creates this little like circle or mycelium, we call it. So the polar heads all polar heads are on the outside, and then the water is going to be on the outside. This is actually how soap is made. So this is what soap does. Okay? So every time you mix in, take a shower, think about um, water organizing these nonpolar molecules. Okay. So then this, the water is outside. So then the soap we're able to rinse off and move out. But then we're able to flush it out with more water, and then the soap is just going to go away. Um, it's not really going to create it into the water or mix with the water and then combine. It's just going to flow away, so we're able to clean ourselves, take a good shower, and then rinse off, rinse off that soap. So it creates this little, like a flower, a little circle with um, polar heads on the outside and non-polar heads on the inside. So no water is inside. Okay. And that's just a quick example. So we got. Let's write a couple of things down. So water organizes non-polar molecules. Okay. So they are, they are able to, they're not really talk to each other, but they'll organize themselves and then you know, we'll get together and we'll leave the water outside and there's nothing inside and all that stuff. That's kind of how I see it. Okay. Now, we have in our cell membranes or in different membranes in our cells, and you'll see different organisms, what's called a phospho, phospholipid bilayer. And phospholipid was a polar head and a nonpolar tail. And phospholipid bilayer is when you have the polar like this, but you have another one underneath as well. So it's this image right here that you can see. Let's change the color here, make it yellow. But it's this image, the polar head, polar head, and then the nonpolar tails on the bottom. So it's able to allow water to be outside and inside as well. So this is kind of how our um, how we have our our cells. So you could think about a cell. You know, let's draw a little cell in here. You think of a cell, and you can have water outside of the cells, but also there's water inside of the cells. But wait, but isn't nonpolar not like water exactly? Since nonpolar doesn't like, it's flipped around, and now you have the polar inside as well. So you're gonna have some make this little drawing a little better. So you're going to have some polar heads outside and polar heads inside as well. And then you're going to have these nonpolar regions in the middle. And that's a phospholipid bilayer. Phospholipid bilayer. Okay. And this is, we'll see this a lot into um, organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry, and you see a lot when we talk about cells. But this is a big characteristic of, of these membranes, these cell membranes. Phospholipid 
five layers. Okay, first layer and end with it. And I'll talk about third three macro mouse layer something like that. You don't know. Mm, yeah, first full with five layers. You can see in this image as well. Water is outside. Water is outside, but nothing in the middle. They don't really like water, so I keep it away. All right. Now, what is another term for polar molecules? Remember what else? Something polar loves water. So another word for loving water is hydrophilic. Let me see if I can spell it. Hydrophilic. Okay. Remember that's water loving. So that's another term for polar molecules. Okay. And water hating would be hydrophobic. All right. Moving to number six. Water dissociates into ions. Remember, an atom is just, uh, say, a carbon with no charge. An ion has a positive or a negative charge. If you remember from last lecture, you know, we got ionic bonds that are made between uh, different ions, are transferring electrons, losing some electrons, giving them away. Those are ions. So water can dissociate or break apart into ions. Okay, so we have a water molecule here, a little hydrogen bond, another water molecule here, and it can dissociate or break apart and create a hydronium ion with a hydroxide ion, or OH minus. Now we're going to talk a little bit about this, why it's important. So we have, if you've never heard of it, um, what's called a pH scale. Okay, the pH scale, it tells something that's very acidic or something that's very basic. And this acidic and basic is based off of hydrogen ions or hydroxide ions. Okay, so let's write down a couple of things in here. So water, and water can be broken down to create uh, hydrogen and hydroxide ions. So I'm gonna do a little bit of drawing because it's easier to explain. I don't have my iPad, but do a little bit of drawing for this. So, so we, when you have an H, I'm going to cancel it. When you have an H plus, and then that's a hydrogen ion, and we have an O, well, it's a big O, OH minus, that's a hydroxide ion. So, hydrogen, hydroxide, like oxygen, hydroxide ion. Okay? So, this is considered. Acidic, and this one is considered basic. It's pretty basic. It's kind of like that one girl, you know. It's pretty basic. Okay, so what does that mean? That means when in a in a solution, when you have something around, the concentration of one or the other has to win. So if we have a pH seven. That means they're pretty. They have the same amount of H plus and OH minus. They have the same amount of both. When something is very acidic, so it has a lot of H pluses, and when something is very basic, it has a lot of OH minuses. Okay? So it's just the concentration of H pluses, H pluses and OH minuses in that uh, solution. Okay? So when we talk about uh, basic and acidic, that's how it is. Something is basic, it has a lot of OHs, and something is acidic, it has a lot of H pluses. Okay, it's a very strong acid, so the more you go down from zero, one, two, three, these are stronger acids, and you got a little less strong acids, and you got less strong bases, and you got the strongest bases. Okay, so let's write down a couple of things that don't forget. Okay, so H plus um, ions are acidic, OH minus ions are basic. Concentration of H plus is high. In solution, it's acidic. And same the other way around. When the concentration of OH minus is high, the solution is basic. Okay? And that's how we uh, categorize between something that's basic or acidic. So, a couple of examples that are relatable. Um, something very basic is bleach. It's very, very basic. It has a lot of OH minuses. And you keep going down a little bit. And you have magnesia, ammonium, salty water. And remember, the middle seven is neutral. Okay, so when the concentration is the same on both, that's when you have a neutral solution, both seven. So let's say 
add in here so we don't forget the number from like uh, 0 to 6 approximately. And then basis we can say um, from about 8 to 14. That would be the same thing, basis. So don't forget those numbers. Okay. So we need to know the concentration. So concent the way we talk about concentration is we have this little uh, bracket. So then we have an H plus. That's a concentration of hydrogen in an ion. So when that is bigger, then the concentration of OH minus is a bit there. It is. So if H plus is higher than OH minus, then that means this is something acidic. That's what it means. So if you're able to write it down, then that's better. Write it down. It's based, I'm just drawing what I wrote here. Concentration of H plus is high, the solution is acidic. Same thing the other way around. So why am I telling you this? Because these are um, like abbreviations that we use a lot um, when we do labs and when we do other questions. You need to know this is concentration. These brackets are concentration. If H plus is greater than OH minus, it's acid. If you flip it around, when the OH is greater than the H minus, then that would be basis. Okay? So make sure you know that's a different concentration. Make sure how we talk about concentration. Okay? Um, again, something very acidic, gastric acid, or inside our uh, intestine. Um, we got lemon juice, orange juice, tomato juice, a little less, black coffee, a little less. Uh, we got urine in here, and distilled water is another one. So here's a, an example. You add acid into that water. You just have water with a lot of H pluses. That's all it means. Okay? Remember H pluses. Um, you got all these little H pluses. And then when you add a base or something basic to water, you just have water with a lot of, let's take another beer, OH minus. Hydroxide ion. Think about it. Mm. Now, we have something what's called buffer systems. So these buffer systems help maintain a stable a pH environment. So buffer systems help maintain a stable pH environment. Okay. Okay. Buffer systems help maintain a stable pH environment. What does that mean? So the buffer is able to realize this is very 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 acidic we gotta get rid of something to neutralize it or make it like stable or make it a good environment so it doesn't hurt our body and it starts to release these h plus from that from that uh, molecule or from that solution and get rid of them so another solution can get um, more uh, basic okay and the other way around if it gets some more get some more it can get acidic okay um, so now for example here Carbonic anhydrase. So we have CO2 and water, and we combine them, um, H2CO3. And then you have these, when you can break it down a little more, dissociate it a little more, then you can start releasing these H pluses. Okay, releasing these H pluses. So get rid of those. So this over here is going to be very basic. And you have these H pluses that we're trying to get rid of to get that rid of that acidity in that solution. Buffer systems help maintain a stable pH environment. Um, so think about our body, think about ourselves. When we start drinking a lot of things that are very acidic, our stomach starts to hurt. Um, we get we increase that pH temperature. So these buffer systems are able to get rid of those H pluses to kind of control and neutralize and give us a balance in our body. And that's how these buffer systems work. That's the whole purpose of them. Okay. So we talk about water having a high specific heat. High heat of vaporization, cohesion and adhesion, so sticking to each other, other molecules, um, ice floats. We talk about how water is an excellent solvent where we can dissolve a lot of things. Water shapes the non molecular uh, molecules, non polar molecules. Um, they're able to flip around and make this bilayer in order to have water on top and on the bottom. And then water dissociates into ions. So a couple questions, which pH value represents a very strong acid? Remember in our notes, acidic H plus is from zero to six. So which is a very, very strong acid? The lower it is, which is down here, okay? Which one would be the strong, strong base? The higher it is up here, okay? 
and how do buffers keep a pH relatively constant? So in other words, or more scientific words, um, a, cop, uh, a buffer can release the H plus ions if it's too high, um, and it can bind some if it's too low or too acidic, okay? So get rid of them or gain some more. It makes it too basic or too acidic. And that concludes the lecture for the week. I'll see you guys on Wednesday.